This is awesome. I'm just so grateful for the space that you all have created to intentionally focus on some dialogue around these things. And I can really feel how genuine it is from Anna. So what a gift that your church is, is offering uh, to just show up, to be able to learn how to show up and be, um, and keep it real. So really grateful to be here. Um, so I'm going to share some slides in a little bit, but first I'll just have, um, Sheba and I can just give a little introduction before I think our faces might go away for the slides. So, um, Anna gave a very gracious introduction. I might carry her around with me wherever I go. Um, <laughs> Uh, but yeah, so I'm a therapist and own Sun Counseling and Wellness in South Park, and um, we try to just have uh, offerings for the whole person, mind, body, and spirit. So you'll hear from um, several of us that come that work with different modalities over this four-week series, and we're always willing to partner and um, and share you know, uh, what we know, but also help link you with other providers or whatever we can do to help. So, um, you'll see our contact information in these slides as well. Um, but I work with mostly teens and adults and, um, lots of anxiety, depression, grief, but also specialize in trauma and eating disorders. Um, and that's my little spiel. So I'll toss it over to Sheba for a brief intro. Well, good morning. Thanks for having me. Um, have the, the, the pleasure of working with Juliet. Um, our specialties are, are, are similar in terms of population. I work with adolescents, teens, and young adults, um, primarily focusing on anxiety, depression, and then, then just kind of uh, life challenges that kind of come our way. So, um, so glad to be here. We're excited about, like Juliet said, just working to um, help people be better. Yes. Okay. So let me go to share screen and start. Okay. All right. Unless someone says something, I'm going to just carry on. Okay. So I think the, the timing of this is wonderful. I like that this is at the, the beginning of the year because this is when you know everyone's talking about resolutions, and um, we like to you know see the new year as a clean slate to kind of start over. And I totally get that from a psychology lens. And um, there is nothing magical about January first. <laughs> um, we can do these things and be really intentional at any point. And so one of the reasons that I really do not like resolutions a lot is because they're, they tend to be very rigid and very uh, negatively framed. So it's a lot of, I'm going to stop doing this. I shouldn't do this. Um, I need to do this differently. And so that's why they really don't work because um, one of the main reasons that they don't work is because they're tied to values that are often not our own, um, or they come with this, this rigidity and, and pressure that just feels like yet another thing that we're failing at or that makes us inadequate. So rather than looking at it like that, um, I love intention words. And so this word flourish is just beautiful. I mean, just let that word settle in for a second, flourish. And what, what comes to mind when you hear that? What do you feel in your body when you hear that? I think it's really important to kind of lean into understanding what that can really mean to embody that and to try to live that. And especially in this time, this is a real time that we're all living in. It can also feel pretty impossible to flourish. How do we flourish when there's uncertainty all around us and uncertainty is the foundation of anxiety. So that's why we all feel on edge. Well, I won't speak for all of us. If you don't, I don't know who you are, but um, <laughs> there are most of us who feel just on edge these past couple of years. And we're having to pivot all the time. And our reserves are so low because we are not wired to, to have to do that. This is a, a trauma that we're all living in together and it can feel really hard to flourish. And we're hoping that this series is a reminder about how we can and how we can find ways to tap into that and what that can look like. So that's what this series is going to be all about. And we're going to try to chip away a little bit to, to, to hope, but to leave us all with some hope and optimism about what it, what can feel like and look like to flourish. Okay. okay. And one of the things that, or the things that me and Juliet are, will talk about 
this morning with you all is that what does it mean to be values aligned? You know, when we're looking at values, that that's our core. What are those things that we believe that are important? What are those things that are fundamental? Um, and how it's shifting, how, how it's evolving, and how our life experiences are just really impacting who we are and how we move forward. And we wanna, and, and of course, with these new challenging times, how are we coping with that? And how how is that possibly shaking our, our core? Mm-hmm. So this morning, Juliet and I will just talk about those things that we can do to just explore what our values are and how we can reinforce those to make sure that we remain in line. Yes, beautiful, okay. Okay, yeah. So values uh, are really foundational, but if you think about it, no one tends to really stop and ask what your values are. Um, we don't tend to, to spend time necessarily reflecting on what our values are. And because of that, we end up kind of gathering things along the way about um, that kind of operate the way we live that might not actually be aligned with our personal values. So we might take on things that are societal values or just peers that are around us or family values. But if they're not personally aligned for us, and if we are in that misalignment, then we're not as fulfilled or satisfied or as balanced as possible or psychologically flexible as possible. So this is why, and and I have done presentations on values since the beginning of my work, because I do think it's foundational. And I tend with my, with clients, I tend to do a values clarification at the beginning and then several, you know, spots along the way to kind of check back in and do a gut check around what are your values? How have they shifted? Because they will shift and and based on what season of life you're in, who you're surrounded by, the self-awareness and personal growth you're experiencing and and things like that. Anything you want to add to that, Sheba? Okay. Okay. So I want to jump in because I want to give us enough time because I actually do want us to go through a clarification together. So You may or may not have received this from Gerald yet. You will receive this handout, but um, if you can either get that handout out or just take out a piece of paper or the notes app in your phone, and hopefully everybody can see this, try to make it big enough. But I'm just gonna invite you to, I'm gonna take, you know, a, a decent amount of time. So don't feel too rushed. These are just, this is one of my favorite values handouts. So this is certainly not all inclusive, but I like this list. If you can just take a look and write down five or 10 that jump out to you that are important to you. So these are just listed kind of basic general values. Um, Jump, just jot down the ones that jump out to you and resonate with you and without overthinking it. And remember that this is your personal kind of project. So not what you think they should be or what, if somebody was looking over your shoulder, what you want them to see just what you really live by. What are the things that are important to you? And so I'm just going to, I'm going to be quiet for several minutes. So you can jot down five or 10. And then I invite you, if you're willing on top of that, to even rank them to to what's the most important to the least important. So let me know if you have any questions, if that's not clear. Interject as you're still going, just to remind everyone, there are no right or wrong answers. It's personal. I know some of them may look similar. Just go with your gut um, and just trust that whatever kind of resonates with you is resonating for a reason. If you have finished, um, perhaps you can just jot down as you look at each of your five or 10, um, jot down what they mean to you. So for example, if you have adventure to one person that might be travel, um, to another, it might be spontaneity, just jot down kind of a few words, a little, little bit about what each of those mean to you individually. Okay, I'd like to, to start chatting. If anyone is um, really feeling strongly, they'd like a few more minutes, please feel free to, to shout out. Um, <clears throat> sorry, I did not mean to do that. Oh, gracious, there we go. Okay, so I wonder, and it's hard, this is, this is where it's a little tricky to be 
virtual. I can't feel the energy. So I'm just, you know, kind of going with it, but I wonder for you, if this was difficult, if it was easy, if there were little hiccups, um, things you got stuck on and started overthinking, or if it even evoked certain feelings, uh, sometimes it brings up, uh, things like guilt or shame, uh, anxiety, Sometimes it brings up excitement, you know, so I would be curious about that for each of you, what even just this initial exercise was like. Uh, there are lots of different directions you can go with this values work. And so in kind of the, in line with what we're doing today, I'm going to just toss out a, um, a few ideas for you to reflect on. You can reflect on in this moment or even jot down what I'm saying to come back to it later. But again, this is all in service of figuring out what's truly important to us to kind of be the, the guiding light, the North star for us uh, as, we, as we try to flourish in this season of our lives. So, you know, one question I would ask is looking at the order of your particular list, if you ranked them, <clears throat> just how you like that order. How does that order feel? If you, if you wish that it looked differently, if you wish that something uh, maybe was not on the list. Um, sometimes people say, gosh, this thing is, this is a top five value for me. This means this is how I'm living my life, but I wish it wasn't so important. So sometimes people wanna knock things off the list. Sometimes people see things on this handout that aren't on their list that they wish did get more of their attention. So take just a minute and think about that. Is there a way that you'd like to reorder or substitute or anything like that. And just take some notes uh, if you notice anything like that coming up for you. I, I can see how the things that are important to me has shift, have shifted as I have gotten older. Mm -hmm. Yes. And I love that insight because that's, I think that they should shift, right? I think that that's important to note how that happens for us individually. So I think that's great insight. Sometimes I'll ask people as well, um, just to kind of keep going with the reflection on this. If there's something on there that you're, you're sort of having a little feeling of stuckness around, uh, where did it come from? You know, I'll often ask clients, uh, where did you learn that value? Where did you learn that messaging? And that can help us discern if that's truly a value of ours, or again, if we've just sort of adopted it because, well, this is how, you know, my family operates, um, or this is, the messaging I'm receiving culturally all the time. So I just kind of assumed this was important, but I think it's important to challenge some of that and recognize that's not truly a value of mine personally, perhaps. The reason I also like for people to jot down a little bit about what each of these mean to you is it's important to me as a therapist for sure, but also in your own personal discernment to understand how that kind of uniquely resonates with you. I gave that example around adventure, but that could fit with any of these. And so that's why I say there's no right or wrong. Uh, whatever something means to you personally and how it kind of fits in your life, that's gonna be kind of what drives you. So I think it's important to understand, um, you know, how these particular things play out in your life. Also, I love, that Nancy said something, if you want to say something, please. And also, I don't know how to, okay, chat. Oh, wait, I'm not supposed to be, I don't know if I'm supposed to be looking at that because I'm sharing my screen. Um, okay, so feel free to say something um, if you'd like to, to jump in. We're very interactive and conversational. <laughs> what else is anybody noticing just around the this initial super quick run through of the values exercise? Um. Hi, I have something to say. Sure. Um, I, I I really find this fascinating. I find that there are a couple that I would be more interested in growing, like like safety is one of my yeah big ones. But I'm thinking maybe recreation and play could be something that could be because it's not even on my list. It could be higher up. 
Sure. And safety could be still there, but a little bit lower. So, I mean, I just think it's fascinating because of all these things, I think they're all, I mean, a part, we all have a little bit of this in us, most of them, but it's the ones that we prioritize. Yes. That, we just need to shift sometimes. Yes. It's great exercise. I love that because another way, again, that we would dig into this is sometimes I'll have people take the 10 that they've written down and give a rating of each of those about how aligned you truly feel like you're living those values, how much energy you feel like you're giving those. So to your point, you'd like to give more energy to recreation and play. Mm-hmm. And so, so the next step around that is to ask what that looks like, you know, so it's less uh, negative and rigid, like we talked about resolutions being right. But he, what are some things that I can in, integrate into my day to day or to my life that looks like recreation and play? What can that really look like? Mm-hmm. Yep. Great. Thank you. Mm-hmm. Yeah, wow. I notice a similar thing where some of the things that I value are the things I struggle with the most. Ooh, yes. Yes. Have a question in the classroom. Yeah. I was interested when I was writing down the, the what it means to me on um, the values. That there was there was a lot of similarity, and I never would have connected these things as meaning the same thing, different things, and I, it made me realize that there was you know the sense of connection and love was so important to me. This was like uh, a revelation, which sounds pretty stupid from a Seven year old, but um, no, that's amazing. Yeah, and if we had all the time, I mean, both of you, I want to invite you to say more. I'm just, but I, um, it's, and I think I caught all of what you said that it was just this revelation of how closely tied those values are and how important they are to you. Did I get that right? Sorry, it's the masks and the owl. <laughs> mm-hmm. um, and then I kind of, I, I did want to touch on what Nancy said as well, Nancy McEwen, that um, the things that are important to you are the things that you struggle with. Mm-hmm. That is so powerful because that to me is the human experience <laughs> that the more invested and important something is to us, the more it matters. So we have um, more feelings about it, just to put it simply. We have much more investment emotionally in it. Therefore, we're going to experience some, um, some dissonance or, or, or struggle because it matters so much. And that's okay. I think that's what I want everybody to hear. That's okay. That doesn't mean it's a wrong value or we need to pivot away from it. Or sometimes it just means this really matters to me. Yeah. I I found it was not hard to identify my values, but to rank them was impossible. Yes. (laughs) I couldn't even begin to rank them. (laughs) Okay. Yeah. Yeah. A lot of people feel some pressure around that. Um, But, you know, I invite you to, to maybe just spend some time with it and see, if that, I think sometimes that can lead people to some clarity uh, because yeah, there are all these things that are important to me, but in the discernment of some of that, and it's not that the numbers, the the ranking itself is that important. It's more around if I'm saying these things are important to me and I'm not aligned with them, that's when things like anxiety, stress, depression, dissonance, irritability, all those things can be more exacerbated because we're less sort of guided by our values. Um, so you might, I mean, I, I would be curious for you over time, if there was any benefit in kind of finding some clarity around that, um, certainly not the case for everybody, but, um, sometimes I think that, that, that yeah, of course things can go hand in hand. Um, these things are equally important to me. Okay. That's fine. Okay. <clears throat> and Juliet, I'm sorry, Do we did have some, um, participants who commented that said that identifying the 10 items came quickly as they were honest about them. Then Mm -hmm. they looked at the list and thought they may be um, a bit shallow, but they, they were real. Mm. Thank you for that honesty. Whoever said that. Yeah. And I would, I was going to say that I think 
for probably the majority of people, family and children, if you have them, are right up there at the top, but you don't have any control really over that. And the rest of these things, you do have somewhat control over. Mm. Yeah, I and mean, I would say depending on, on again, what, what it means to you, right? Yeah, mm -hmm. uh, because we can control how much energy we might put into our children, for example or not, but, but that's a really astute observation too. Sheba, would you, do you have any comments on the person who put that in the chat on what they said? Yeah, actually, you know, um, it's kind of hard sometimes whenever we self-reflect and, and look at what we value. And sometimes it's hard for us to put ourselves first per se hmm. to where we might feel a little bit conflicted about um, where we rank our importance, just because sometimes we can be also so giving to mm -hmm. other folks that it's hard for us to focus on ourselves. But whenever we look at our values, those are the things that drive us and regenerate us sometimes so we can be the mm -hmm. things that we need to be in different situations with different individuals and tackling different kinds of events. Yes. Yeah. And I think that's where we don't, we shouldn't assign judgment to yeah. any of these. Yeah. There's no good or bad. Um, that's a great way to put it. That kind of goes back to the self-care piece, which we'll definitely touch on throughout the series. Mm -hmm. For me, it was easy to um, get to the 10 values, um, like family, friendships, travel, being of service. But I like the ranking part because I, I right away put mental health and physical health because I've struggled with depression in the past. And so without my mental health, I can't do any of the values. I, I can't travel. I can't be with friends and family. And so that has to come first. Yes. Yep. It's a good reminder. <laughs> Juliet, I was, um, I'm realizing that on my list, I, I think I'm living into a lot of the values on my list, but this was helpful for me because I look, looking through, I realize I'm putting a lot of energy into things that I don't consider values. And that mm. is really helpful too, you know? Um, so thank you for that. Yes. Yes. And that is a recipe for burnout, <laughs> <laughs> right? Yes. So finding balance, right? It's not to say, okay, just let them go, but balance. Um, that's why I think it's so helpful to check in with this a lot. <laughs> mm. a lot. Okay. At any point, please interject. I'm going to, I think we've probably, yep. Yeah, we touched on this a little bit for sure. Um, that all of the buzzwords that you've heard, particularly over the past couple of years, like burnout and stress and lack of boundaries and anxiety, um, physical illness that, you know, Sheba will touch on some of that. All of those things can be indicators that things are out of alignment with our values. And this is, it's not a, um, a cure, but it is, it can be an indicator of that. So again, after you've spent time really reflecting on this and maybe on some of those um, questions that I've posited to you, see if you can set some intentions around better alignment. So what would that look like in your day-to-day -day for your energy to go to your true top three to five to 10, right? Um, to have a better balance. And then what do you need to implement that? Because that's the next step is it's, we can't just say, I'm going to do that, but what do I really need to implement that? It might be around accountability. So setting boundaries with certain people or asking people for what you need to help these things play out. Um, and so I think that piece is, is often what gets lost in like New Year's resolutions, for example, you know, I should stop doing this, but what does that really look like? Um, so being able to really apply it and figure out how to ask for what you need to, to allow it to happen. Okay. Yes. So 
uh, this is a little bit of just what I was just saying about um, in order to be willing to implement some of this, to Shiva's point earlier, we have to be willing to address our own needs. And sometimes that looks like putting ourselves first or, or saying no to people or things that maybe don't come as naturally for us or don't feel comfortable. And we do a lot of talking about self-compassion and how that that's what this is. Self-compassion does not mean just, oh, I love myself and I get all my needs met and it's not all rainbows and unicorns. Self-compassion is I see myself in all of my humanness, which means flaws, struggles, um, all, of the, all of the things, and I still accept myself. And if we can do that and, and learn how to integrate it all, then we are more willing to um, implement self-care. And um, we're going to let our self-care guru, um, Sandra, I think is the last uh, series session of the series for you guys to really um, hone in on what uh, self-care uh, means. But in light of this conversation, it's really just around um, tending to our values. Self-care can be tending to our values. And when we don't um, do self-care and we're not paying attention to ourselves and as Juliet said about being able to see yourself and accept yourself, we, we have to make sure that we're paying attention to ourselves and in all the things that, that we have going on. And one of the biggest things when I work with, with people um, regardless of age, regardless circumstances, you, it's very important to listen to your body. It, it's easy if, if, if we're hungry, for some people, your stomach will growl. Mm -hmm. You know, if you're thirsty, your mouth might get a little bit dry. If you have something in your eyes, a, a speck of dirt or dust, then you'll start blinking. Our bodies will give us all different kind of cues when we're um, out of order. A, a quick, a, a new COVID cue for myself was that for a week or two, I had a sore throat. So I thought that I had a cold. I thought something was going on. But what I realized, it wasn't a sore throat. It was tension. That was a new way that my body spoke to myself. And I had to realize, okay, I'm stressing. And now my vocal, my, my, mus my throat muscles are tensing. So that's how my body was talking to me, but I, it was hard to make the connection, especially whenever stuff is physically going on with us. And of course we wanna make sure we rule out medical circumstances, but sometimes there are things psychologically, emotionally, stressfully that's going on that impacts us and our body is telling us, hey, there's a red flag going on, whether or not it's because we're fatigued with low energy, whether or not we might have a headache, whether or not our stomach um, is upset, we might have chest pains, we might have problems with sleeping, um, our sleep might be um, interrupted, um, we, we're, we're waking up multiple times throughout the night or we're having problems just going to sleep. Um, we might end up having, um, like I said, the muscle tensions, our body might start to shake, we might start to sweat. So it's really important that we're paying attention to, you know, internally what's going on with us and how um, it, stress kind of presents ourselves from a physical standpoint. From an emotional standpoint, we might become hypersensitive. We might be easily aggravated or frustrated, moody, it could be a situation where we're overwhelmed. Um, if it was a situation where um, if we were ranking on a scale of one to 10, um, really when it was a stress level of two, the, our reaction to it might have been an eight or a 10, just because we have so much going on that again, our body has given us those clues, but we're not making the connection. So it's really important for us to um, be cognizant of how what's going on externally can show up internally 
whether or not it's physical, whether or not it's emotional. Mm -hmm. So when we do notice it, what do we do? <laughs> right? Mm -hmm. So the noticing is the first step um, often. And so these are just some other kind of general reminders because, you know, the, the big takeaway is like I said before, maybe your values become kind of your guiding light. So you notice some of these things that she was talking about, you can come back to the values. It's also really important to remember exactly like what uh, one of you pointed out about the values list earlier, what's in our control versus what's out of our control. And that is something that ooh, we have all had a lesson on during this pandemic, <laughs> especially remember at the beginning when what was out of our control even included if we could buy enough toilet paper and Clorox wipes, right? I mean, there was, there is so much that we are taught or shown in life that truly is out of our control. And we have to learn how to safely let go of that, but then how to also lean into those things that are in our control. So we don't feel um, so unhinged and like we're spiraling, but it's important to discern between the two. So we don't get so stuck on trying to control the things that truly we cannot. We'll talk about coping skills more in a little bit. Um, and these other things we've also uh, referenced as well that the assertiveness piece, what I really mean by that in this particular slide is being able to identify and ask for what you need. It's really, really hard for a lot of people that we either people please or we kind of sweep it under the rug and I'll get to that later or it's not, we minimize, we compare, we do all sorts of things that sometimes don't include saying, this is what I need and I know how to ask for it. So being able to strengthen our assertiveness skills so that we can meet the needs within those values. So coping skills, uh, what I want, you know, one thing I really think is important for people to understand about coping skills is how individualized they are. So what works for you may not work for me. What works for me today may not work for me tomorrow or even in 30 minutes. So the thing with coping skills is so much about trial and error and having go-to strategies for all sorts of different, you know, emotions and experiences and times uh, so that we, we feel like we have a toolbox. And I like to describe coping skills within three categories. So we kind of can be really intent, not kind of, so that we can be intentional about which we use. Because for a lot of us, distraction is the go-to coping skill that we don't even realize we're, we're doing. And I'm not knocking distraction, that, that goes within the uh, avoidance oriented category. But what I want us to be is really intentional about choosing distraction if that's warranted in a situation, not just defaulting to that. So avoidance oriented skills are those that are distractions. And sometimes we need that. Sometimes we're not you know, in a space where we can um, go there, if you will, and we can kind of process the emotion uh, and so it's okay, it's absolutely okay to, to have a distraction, but just knowing that you're intentionally choosing it and why. Problem solving coping strategies are those that fit with, you know, I, I have a, an identifiable problem and I am going to use these steps to solve it. So it might be even just things like creating a to-do list um, or specifically asking someone to do something. So it's very kind of cut and dry. Here's the problem. Here's the strategy. Emotion oriented coping skills are basically all of the gems that you learn in therapy <laughs> and things like that, that are about processing the emotion, dealing with the emotion, going into the emotion a little bit. And that can feel kind of daunting sometimes, you know, I don't want to open the floodgates because then I'll never be able to reel it back in. And so much of our work as therapists is helping people understand that that's not how it works, you know, that it either is temporary or that you can learn to trust yourself in the feeling or in the experience and that you can learn these skills to help you move through it because to heal it, you got to feel it. So there's a cheesy rhyme for you. We like cheesy rhymes and acronyms and therapy. <laughs> So you're going to get this handout as well, um, but our intern helped us put together just some low, medium, and high effort coping skills, which I also totally appreciate the permission of knowing that you can 
pick and choose from even these categories because it, it all depends on kind of your capacity at any given time. So you'll get this in a handout. Don't feel like you need to read it all right now, but we've sort of broken it down. Um, some of these are you know, low because they take less time. Um, they take less kind of involvement in something all the way up to high, which means you're gonna actually do a little bit more quote unquote work uh, to, to go there. Any thoughts or comments at this point? And this is certainly not all inclusive. And like I said, some, you might look at this and say, Juliet, I'm not gonna have a dance party, I, you know, and that's okay. Um, and also, what if you did try to have a dance party? What if you were a little bit curious about how that might work for you as a coping skill? So we would like to do this, um, one of our favorite coping skills, um, breathing technique with you all. And the reason we chose this one is because our breath is our greatest coping skill because it is always with us. And I know that you have probably heard in different capacities about breathing and you might kind of think, I, I don't get it, I'm always breathing. But if you really learn how to bring your attention and your awareness to your breath, you might notice things like Sheba mentioned earlier, like a tightness, a shallowness to your breath. Maybe your breath is super constricted in your throat or is only from you know, the chest up when what we really need is that deep open breathing. Because so often, especially when we're living again in this season of uncertainty, we can be living in that fight, flight or freeze response because we're again, constantly trying to navigate changing information and engage risks and um, you know, we're using that word pivot all the time, like that keeps us a little bit more on edge. So really being able to clue into our bodies and our breaths and by using a longer exhale than inhale, we can bring that parasympathetic nervous system online, which is the rest and digest system, which counters that fight or flight system. So our breath is really powerful. So I'm just gonna invite us, um, the numbers are less important. Sometimes people get super stuck on that. I don't want you to really worry about the counting. I'm gonna lead us through it, but what I really want is a slow, long, deep exhale. So uh, if, you're, if you're willing, I invite you to just with me, kind of let all the air out of your lungs. And then we're gonna breathe into a count of four. Hold at the top for seven. You can have your own count. And when you get there, breathe out for eight. Slow. And to your own cadence, I want you to do this two or three, three more times. Breathing in for four, holding for seven, breathing out for eight. Noticing, just noticing how the breath feels in your nostrils, in your throat, in your chest, to your belly, seeing if you can lengthen and deepen it. Breathing in for four, holding it. And the holding is important. It brings online your body's just natural desire to replenish its oxygen and restore balance. Long exhale. So you have this with you at any time. And so sometimes you know, we'll encourage people to pair it with something. So not just waiting for yourself to feel stressed to use this breathing, but to try to incorporate it more regularly. So sometimes we'll pair it behaviorally with something like every time you're at a red light, practice your four, seven, eight breathing, um, you know, something like that, where you can really remember to utilize the breath. Um, and I have all of this in a handout and Daryl, I actually did not send that to you, but I'm happy to do that. That might be helpful. Okay, any added for next week and we'll email it to the Zoom participants. Okay. okay. Anything from the chat that I'm missing? I don't want to pull it up in case someone's 
So I think we're coming up uh, on our time, Juliet, but I want you, if you're, if you're virtual, I put um, the information about Sun Counseling and Wellness, as well as how to follow um, on Instagram in there, if you are interested in that. And also next week, um, we're going to be talking about a buzzword, um, authenticity, authentically, how do we show up authentically? Um, and so I'm very excited. I hope you're coming back for that one next week. I think this, this week has laid a great foundation for that. And I know that in our own ways, wherever we are, we can, um, thank Juliet and Sheba for a wonderful session. And if you have questions that occur to you and you want to email them to me, I will get them to these yes. folks, um, who may be able to help answer, um, going forward. I wish we had a whole nother hour to talk about these things, but thank you so much, Sheba. Yeah. Thank you, Juliet. Um, check the chat and um, we'll see all of you hopefully next week.